the techie taking care of it reminds me of my days in uh, music industry arts in college where um you'd have the patch bay that we called the spaghetti bowl like it was just all this you know in those days we used to do razor blade edits on you know quarter inch tape right so you'd have the grease pencil and you'd kind of rock it back and forth on the heads and watch the meters and then grease mark it with the grease pencil and then razor blade that's those old school man all right let's try this hang on it's time for the access of easy podcast You guys ready to start? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hey, everybody. <clears throat> it is Mark Jeftovic here with Charles Hugh Smith from Hawaii, Jesse Hirsch from the Ottawa Valley. I'm in Toronto, Etobicoke to be exact. This is the fourth V Salon or E Salon or Salon that we're doing online for the Axis of Easy. Thanks for joining us. And before we started, Charles, you you sent out sort of a topic for today. You wanted to talk about what lies beyond the neoliberal global economy that is now heading to oblivion. And now that globalization and financialization are dead, what lies next? I think that's a good topic because I got nothing for this week. So, <laughs> Well, I think you guys have written uh, about this uh about the oblivion and and, and 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 our interest in what lies beyond i mean you guys have each addressed that n- numerous times in different you know contexts so i think we're all well versed in it so i guess um somebody well, has and to i think it's describe i think it's particularly it relevant because uh-huh. the the vibe i'm getting from people is there is desire to, to to know what's next and and while the uh, the status quo while there's still many people in denial as to whether we can return to normal or whether we can retrieve the status quo i think there's a lot of people who in my case i i keep using the word event horizon i can't even remember what it was like before this pandemic it, it feels as if that was so long ago in a galaxy long long ago that you know i i feel that this is the opportunity to talk about what what's next and I think we're at a fork in the road where on the one hand, uh, to, to use I, I've, Mark, your Isaac Asimov foundation uh, uh, reference keeps haunting me, keeps coming back. So either we're seeing a, a total collapse of civilization as sort of Isaac Asimov described in foundation or Charles to where I hope you're taking this, there are alternatives we can start talking about that can actually salvage the the catastrophe, salvage the destruction that uh, is the fall of neoliberalism and pivot into something else, pivot into something better. Because that's certainly where I have some ideas as to where we could go and how this ties to my own faith in the internet and the internet as both uh, a means of organizing society and a means of governing society insofar as it's democratic. And so I, I, I think it is very relevant and very timely to, to talk about what comes next. Yeah. Can, I, can I just jump in quickly uh, mm-hmm. and fill in the blank on a reference Jesse made to the Isaac Asimov's Foundation trilogy? Because that's from The Lost Session. That was the very first salon where we only got <laughs> one side of the audio. And we talked about Isaac Asimov's Foundation and the backstory to that. Isaac Asimov, of course, legendary science fiction writer, and his foundation trilogy talked about this this society of academics that were exiled to a far-off solar system, and what happened was they saw a dark age coming for the Galactic Empire, and their plan, what success looked like to the foundation, was that they were going to take what they saw as a 30,000 year dark age and reduce it to a 1,000 year dark age and that's what success looked like and when we talked about it in the first salon I made that analogy because the way I see things completely breaking down and no return to normality the way we understand it or understood it 
just a few months ago, I see, I, I made the quip that there was a dark age coming and success would be if we were able to compress that dark age from being a, mul a multi-generational slog through authoritarianism and oppressive, in my mind, collectivism and other forms of, of thought control to maybe half a generation in 15, 20 years would be success to me. Charles, I think you were about to say something. I was just going to um, do the, the similar thing, which was fill in the blanks about globalization and financialization, which are the two core drivers of, of what's called neoliberalism. <clears throat> and um, the reason why it's called neoliberalism, just and I'm sure most of the listeners or viewers know this, but I'm just going to kind of do a quick <clears throat> kind of fill in the blank here. Uh, a liberal economy is one that um, is an open market economy where labor and capital, you know, float around and, and find each other and, and um, you know, the invisible hand of capitalism makes everybody richer. And of course, that that's um, a lot of that is true. In other words, if you open an economy where people can choose to to be as productive as they can and they have access to capital, then you get a more productive society. Neoliberalism is, well, let's do this on a global scale. So money can slosh around from um, Aberdeen to um, Adeline to New York and, and in seconds, right? Just wherever it's going to seek some kind of fast return. And this is going to somehow allow the global economy to be more productive because there's trillions in capital that used to be kind of limited within its national borders can now slosh around the entire world. And labor is now... Uh, also globalized in the sense that call centers and a lot of a lot of, of, of uh, service sector jobs can be done anywhere in the world. You know, so you have this uh, open economy that's supposed to make everybody richer. Well, the the downside of that is it's it's really um, a system primed for exploitation. <laughs> so the, all that global capital goes into a mine somewhere in some third world country with very poor environmental standards and corrupt government. And it rips everything of value out of the earth and then leaves a gaping hole and, and, and an impoverished community around it. And, and that's the, the, the ugly side of globalization. Financialization is, well, if money's good, well, then more money's even better, right? So let's just print or borrow trillions into existence and then we'll spend it like crazy and gamble it in speculative ventures and we're all going to get richer because of this. And so this uh, ex uh, dependence on um, leverage and um, credit is what financialization is. And what it does is it creates incredibly perverse incentives to speculate and create asset bubbles and that kind of thing, rather than actually do the really boring long-term thing of investing in productive uh, assets. Uh, and so those two things are basically, uh, have been running on extremes for like 20 years. And the status quo has maintained itself by kicking the can full you know, instead of allowing um, a forest fire to burn down all the malin investments and, and speculative gambles, then it's just, well, let's just double down and we'll create more debt, more leverage and more asset bubbles. And so now we're at the end of the road. Those two systems are collapsing visibly before our very eyes. And what I find interesting, too, about the way you describe that is on the one hand, it's, it's sort of what I call the dual roles of coercion. That on the one hand, the extreme amount of debt and leverage, you know, is is used basically to force people to do things they don't want to do. You know, this is partly how the United States was able to control the policies of many other countries who were indebted to them, and similarly using debt as a way to limit social policies, to limit social spending, because it's already been spent. Therefore, we can't do it for these needs. And then at the same time. You know, the original sort of a uh, liberal marketplace assumes that labor has a certain amount of free choice. But in a neoliberal environment, labor has very little choice, in part because of the dynamics of globalization, right? Oh, you want to unionize? Fine, we'll close the factory and we'll move production overseas, where an authoritarian government ensures that the labor market is obedient and cheap. And all of these principles kind of undermine the original sort of freedoms that we associate with liberal free market societies. And that was often to me the big contradiction of neoliberalism is that 
you know, I used to describe it as Mickey Mouse distracts while Confucius organizes. That it has the mythology of individual freedom with the kind of Kiritsu effect of corporate control that actually greatly restricts both the freedoms of la labor, the freedoms of the worker, but also the freedoms of many producers. Because unless you are a transnational corporation, you've really got no hope of being an equal member in the neoliberal economy. You know, as you were saying that, the thought occurred to me, it's not just globalization now, it's automation that completely skews the algorithm, or the, 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 the weight of choice or constricts the choice against labor and small business and that sort of thing. And I even made a note, automation is the new globalization. Because as these imbalances of globalization become top heavy and they're the system is ready to collapse underneath its own contradictions. Example, the globalization wasn't necessarily built on debt as much as it was built on the reserve currency status of the US dollar, that for a few decades it could pretend to be as good as gold. And then they thought, you know, we can juice our returns a bit by using debt. And when this game sort of started, call it 1972 or so, you could you could actually, there's people who have graphed this, you could get like $7 of GDP growth from $1 of debt issuance. And as we kept doing that and doing that over the decades as they played out, the amount of GDP growth you could get from every additional dollar of credit money created was coming down, coming down, coming down till now. I can't remember the exact figure, but it's it's less than par. So every time we generate a new dollar of credit money expansion, we get less than a dollar of GDP expansion. And that's where you start to see the the system's contradictions collapsing the system itself. And now it is about the credit because the credit is all we have left. The, the good as gold metaphor or idea behind the US dollar Nobody believes it anymore, even when talking heads talk up a strong dollar policy. So now it's just, well, the full faith and credit of the U.S. government makes it sort of as good as gold, but everybody knows it's not really as good as gold. So what's the next thing after globalization? Well, we're living in a technocracy or an ascending technocracy. It's the automation. Everyone has this holy grail of AI, which doesn't really exist in my mind. It's just expert systems becoming more and more integrated and defined and automation. So now you're not even competing against workers in another country that will work for cheap. You're, complete, you're competing against a black box the size of an Apple TV that can run a multinational corporation. It's like the old Jetson cartoon where George Jetson would show up to work every morning and press a button on his desk and that was, that was the, at the end of the day he would turn it off and go home. That's what we're aspiring to, really. Well, Jesse, I'm sure you have a lot to respond to the, that. So why don't you no, go ahead? No, by all means, I'll, Charles, we've got lots of time. <clears throat> OK, well, I, I'm going to insert something on a, a little different tangent, just a final thought on, on, on globalization. What, what is really perverse about it to me um, is that it, it, um, it strips away all of your local economy except for whatever is globally competitive. So. We look at Northern Italy, you know, and, and a lot of it's been hollowed out. Hawaii, uh, where I live uh, right now, it's like 80% of the food was grown locally a, a generation or two ago. Now it's 5% because the only thing that's globally competitive is nothing we grow for food. It's only tourism. And so now you see all these tourist dependent towns and cities and regions all being completely wiped out now that tourism's dead because they... They, globalization drove them into a hyper competitive globalized market where the only thing they could sell of value was tourism. And so they became totally dependent on it. And um, any kind of system in, is, in which you're totally dependent on something that's in itself fragile, uh, then you're, you know, your whole economy is fragile. And that's why the global economy is collapsing. It was always intrinsically fragile. Well, and, and your, your post about municipal tax bases kind of, it, it reminded me of, of both 
how I saw the recovery to the 2008 financial crisis, which was paradoxical in that some people recovered quite effectively, other people still haven't recovered. That the nature of the 2008 financial crisis was that while it appeared to affect everybody, that the more time went on, it was clear that, you know, that the less money you had, the harder it hit you. And if you didn't live, for example, in coastal America, if you didn't live in major cities, that your local economy never rebounded. And so your post about, you know, the 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 impact on municipal tax bases, and, and it, you're reminding me now in terms of municipalities that are based on tourism, that are based on uh, uh, single sectors that are particularly vulnerable to this crisis, they may not rebound. That what we could see in, in neoliberalism's attempt to keep itself alive, it will create the myth of recovery when most people don't recover. That you know, New York City might recover, LA might recover, Toronto might recover. But that doesn't mean that smaller communities will. And that both exacerbates the urban-rural divide that currently dominates North American politics, but I think it might allow for a period of denial in which we can pretend that everything is fine. Because part of my motivation to talk about what comes next is I have both hopes and fears, right? I have hopes of what I want to come next. But my fear, as we've articulated in past episodes, is the Amazon economy. Right, the idea that we're going to end up with these platforms creating the digital equivalent of company towns, in which they literally own everything and control the currency, you know that that's my fear of what comes after neoliberalism is a kind of technocratic authoritarianism. But at the same time, I think there's an opportunity, and this is where I'll bring it back to automation. You know, I, I don't actually fear automation, and I think it's because I feel confident that I understand it that I recognize that technology can be configured according to any ideology. So you could configure technology to serve the interests of monopoly, or you could configure technology to serve the interests of a distributed society or a democratic society. And that's where I, it's not so much that I fear automation, rather I fear the, the technology industry continuing in its monopoly ways when the opportunity is antitrust, when the opportunity is to think about the type of society we desire and use technology to obtain it by a, a literally a different configuration or a different prioritization of our values in terms of how we use it. And that's where I am cautiously optimistic that there are a growing, for lack of a better word, social movement online of people who are connected to this notion of a decentralized society either through open source software through cryptocurrency through their own democratic ideals but it's more a question of how do you bring body how do you bring form how do you uh, uh, uh bring gravitas to such a movement given that currently it's so grassroots i'm not even sure it knows that it exists outside of some of the, some of the cryptocurrency types who perhaps believe it exists more so than it actually does So, um, we've talked about this before, even predating the Salon series, when Charles and I talked about in a separate podcast for one of the audio books, how um, this takes the form, what you're talking about takes the form, not so much of a change in governance structure as much of a colossal opt-out of a current system, where just these other emergent configurations rise up and I think that's where your fear comes from there's going to be all kinds of challengers to the current system as the current system sort of uh, abrogates its own legitimacy which I think is happening all around us and so what's going to pop up in its place well the strongest players at the table right now are Google and Amazon and, the, and Facebook and, and I don't think any sane person really wants that uh, why I think this is a particularly sensitive time in history is because, you know, one thing, Jesse, that I might sort of push back on gently is you're saying, you know, we'll have this, this 
period where we can pretend everything is recovering for a while, even though the coastals and the big cities will kind of look like it's recovering and, the, and everybody else will not. I think that's already happened. That's what's been going on since the last financial crisis. And that's why there was such, um, such a violent glitch in the matrix at the last election was because people are like, why is everyone walking around talking about how great the last eight years are when my retirement is still down 60% and these other guys are super rich and getting super richer and I, you know, my job got off short. And even, you know, the so great... to be clear... Go ahead. You're arguing, like, because I think we agree that that is what's been happening. And our, is what you're saying is you think that's over. Well, I think that's... Versus I'm saying I think that that'll continue for a little bit. So you're saying it's going to continue. Yeah, I guess that would be the only real difference is, is what I took away from what you were saying was like, there's going to be this period of, and I'm like, we've been soaking in it for 10 years. That might, yeah. conti that might yeah. continue for a while. Yeah, that might continue for a while because... For one thing, people so badly, myself included, right? I would love to just wake up tomorrow and be able to believe that everything's under control and it's going to be okay. Like, I would really love to be able to believe that, but I can't. And I think yeah. a lot of people who have maybe more refined abilities to put on blinders than I do will, will be able to believe it for maybe six weeks or six months before they finally realize, hey, wait a minute. You know, Elon Musk just got a $98 billion pay package, and my the business that I've been running for the last 20 years isn't allowed to open for another six months. What's going on here? <clears throat> I'm going to make three points that I hope you guys can bounce off of. <clears throat> One is I want to go back to, like, the, the, the actual material level of our society. Like, you know, we're not going to be jetting around anymore. Things are going to be more expensive. Well, what, what, what kind of life can we have? And, and I always go back to this um, wonderful video. You guys might have seen it. Somebody went down Market Street in San Francisco in 1906, a couple of months before the, the earthquake. And, they, and, and you just, for five minutes, you're seeing life in 1906, and it was wonderful. I mean, there were streetcars, there were horse drawn carts. I mean, there was, guy, there was no street lights. I mean, it was just like everybody just managed, right? It was like this self organizing system. Um, and people had plenty of food and they had uh, entertainment and, and what percentage of the of the kilocalories of energy that we burn now and think are absolutely essential what percentage was necessary then I'm guessing five percent and it was horribly inefficient they were using like these you know coal-fired you know tractors and all this stuff that was just ridiculously inefficient with with today's technology and efficiencies I'm thinking we can live really well on 10% of what we waste. I mean, remember, America, now I don't know about Canada, but USA wastes, throws away 40% of its food, you know, at one, at one stage or the, or the other. I mean, it's all like, talk about a wasteful society. So that's where, like, if we want to have a sustainable, you know, civilization, we can, we can do so much with so much less you know, with within a system that's that's actually looking at that, as opposed to the more we waste, the more growth we get, and therefore the more money everybody's making. You know, that kind of insanity. So that's one point. The other point is, I think what we're when I'm hearing you guys, it's like I think we're in this like sort of three part choice thing, which is the status quo wants us to believe that we can go back exactly to December 2019 and you know, the V-shaped recovery. Other ones are like, well, we all will wear masks and we'll be six feet apart and it'll be almost as good as the good old days, right? And then the, then the reality is the third one, which is now there's gonna be some reset, right? And that's what we're talking about. And um, to, um, to Jesse's point about technology and, you know, I think the Chinese have taken the one track we're all afraid of, right? The 100,000 cameras in every city and uh, this huge workforce devoted to tracking everybody. I think that's an extreme. And I, I wrote about the Tao, which was, you know, the Tao of, of ancient Chinese philosophy, right? Taoism. And I, I quoted a line from my old professor's translation of the Tao Te Ching. And, and it was like, I forget the exact line, but it's like, you know, if you take things to extremes, they're not going to last long. Mm -hmm. And I'd say that's the, that's the Chinese um, ramping up the surveillance authoritarian state to like, you know, max, I, I don't, I think that's an extreme that's not going to last. 
So what's the alternative? Well, a decentralized, localized economy where we no longer are exposing ourselves to globalizations like moral hazards and, and, and sort of like insanities. Can I just jump and in I for one quick sec? Go ahead. So yeah. one of your options, Charles, I think there's actually like an option 3B. And we've talked about <laughs> this before, which is the governments will say, well, we're going to go back to how it was before, except it's going to be a little bit different uh, because we now have to protect you from each other for safety's sake. And there's going to be some kind of a reset. There'll never be a return to normalcy, but we're still going to be the people in charge after this reset. And there's this assumption, what they don't really understand, and this is true in almost any sphere of, of human activity, whether it's a financial market, you're looking at a financial system or an economy or anything else, when there's a big reboot, leadership changes. So whoever, whatever the dominant force was before the reset, is not the dominant force after the reset. And I think governments and policymakers today are trying to say, well, yeah, there's going to be a reset because we can never let you have your civil liberties back, but we're still going to be the ones that get to do call all the shots after it's over. And I think that's where they're kind of naive and mistaken. And what we're talking about here is now some of the, you know, if I was, if I was a complete, I don't know, red pilled whatever you know smash the state guy be like yeah this is going to be awesome we're going to smash the state but then if if it, if it is google and if it is facebook and if it is amazon that comes after this reset you're out of the frying pan and into the fire so um the, the taoism post by the way that was going to be if we were going to stick to the format of what did each other write this week it was the taoism post because that helped me remember that I used to pay a lot more attention to things like, um, you know, my mental energy and stuff like that. And I mean, used to like six weeks ago. <laughs> and so <laughs> late, lately I've been realizing that I've been walking around in this state that's almost frenetic mentally. And, it, it, you know, I pulled a couple of my old books off the shelf. And, and one of the things really leapt out at me about what you wrote but you know i won't i won't go into that now but that was that was a very good post it was a short one but again that that's to the point of what i was just talking to where the dow is reversals so the governments and the policymakers think this is sort of immutable the fed has our back and the fed is going to control things but you realize you know the dow has that sort of almost perverse way of showing you that whatever you think is immutable is not immutable and whatever you think is irrelevant is relevant and so on and so forth so i i think regime change is a gift and while you're right to say that there are many regimes who may be in denial about that i think the question is not whether regime change is coming the question is what kind of regime do we desire what kind of regime what must we prevent I am also uh, an aspiring sage who tries to walk the path. And I think the value, of, to me, of, of Taoism as a philosophy is it acknowledges the dynamism of the universe, that everything is always changing. And I, I'm also a, a, a student of Marshall McLuhan. And Marshall McLuhan had this idea of the tetrad, that you can evaluate everything through four principles is enhanced, what is obsolesced, what is reversed, and what is retrieved. And I, I find that as a, a, a methodology, a way, a framework to ask questions, you could say, well, what does COVID-19 does? Well, on the one hand, it's retrieved sourdough baking, where now all of a sudden people can't get a hold of yeast, and they're figuring out how to use natural yeast, i.e. sourdough, to bake the bread that they need. Well, what is it reversed? Well, it's reversed where we do our work. We used to have to commute and go to these stupid downtown huge condos and buildings. And now all of a sudden, everyone gets to work from home. And there are many people who are going, this rocks. This is the quality of life that I desire. Because certainly in the case of Toronto, the average commute is 90 minutes, sometimes two hours, four hours a day in your car. That's killing you, right? So that's a great example of a reversal. Well, what does it enhance? Well, COVID-19, I think, has enhanced our relationship with knowledge. 
it forces people, even reluctant people, to be curious because they're anxious and they're afraid and they want to know what's going on and they're trying to figure out what's going on. And then the final question is, what is COVID-19 obsolesced? Well, I think that's the subject of our discussion today. It's obsolesced neoliberalism. It's obsolesced the regime that we already knew was kind of crooked and flawed and inefficient. And it was uh, uh, so brittle and fragile that it has not stood up to this particular crisis. And, and this is where I'll point out to say, I think that our format for these podcasts was like training wheels. It was a way to kind of get us into the motion versus now that we come up with like one big topic where we really try to bend our heads around, we're still going to cite each other's latest posts. <laughs> we're still going to talk about all these different ideas, but now we're focusing even more uh, particularly because Charles, I agree a hundred percent with you about waste and the extent to which that the neoliberal society, that the contemporary North American society was ludicrously wasteful to the extent that that's what I think historians will note when they look back at that particular era of human history. It's like, could they not have seen how wasteful they were? Like, why did they not see the warning signs? Like, their language is full of all these references to waste, and yet they could not adjust their lifestyle accordingly. And I do think that that's going to be part of how we pivot. I think that's why decentralized local democracies offer a solution, because they allow for a much more efficient resource allocation. And part of that reflects not just the economic necessities of such systems when it comes to redundancy and sustainability, but dignity and respect. Because that's what's lost. That's what I see when it comes to a lot of these small towns where the factory was shuttered, or the economy was lost, that you have mental health issues because people don't have a sense of self-esteem, they don't have a sense of purpose. And if they are self-sufficient, if they are part of their own working environment, I think that that changes things dramatically. And the reason I was interested in your post about taxes and municipal bases is the, the Leonard County where I live is in a similar precarity because what used to be a vibrant agricultural community, like all agriculture, became essentially single crop or single industry, and that's maple syrup, right? We became a major global maple syrup producer because, to your point, that was what we could do on a competitive level. But maple syrup depends upon tourism, that all the maple syrup operators don't actually make their money from selling maple syrup. They make their money from agritourism, people coming in maple syrup season to have pancakes and sausages and all the other aspects. So they all got devastated this year. And I personally don't think that they're gonna have a season next year either, because I don't think we're gonna be out of this mess by then. And so that's gonna devastate the local economy. But at the same time, everyone's talking about how we used to have abattoirs. We used to have meat processing plants. We have lots of cattle producers, we have lots of pork producers, but we don't have the ability to manage that meat locally. And I think that's gonna change. I think we're gonna see boutique abattoirs emerge. I think we're gonna see organic types of meat processing emerge because they already exist on the cottage style and they're now oversubscribed. They're making so much money because they're serving people directly. So that all gives me cautious optimism that the seeds are there for people to, at least on an entrepreneurial level, if not ho hopefully on a public policy level, really step up and reclaim that self-sustaining local economic activity. I'll tell you what I like about inefficiency. Like when we talk about, um, really, because I think overall people as groups and societies, they do not willingly pare back their standards of living. All right? If somebody says, for the good of the environment, you all have to go like this, you, you have a rebellion, you have a mutiny. But if you have inefficiencies in the system, I'm not saying that they're a good thing, but what I like about them is if you can concentrate your efforts, if you can focus on wringing out e inefficiencies so that you're not throwing out 40% of your food, you're reducing that on a secular level over, let's say, the next 5, 10, 15 years, that almost feels like a breakthrough. It's like you have a new source of energy. It's just suddenly, it's like, oh, we have the land of plenty now. 
but we're actually reducing our waste and our output. And all you've really done is you haven't increased your input or increased your output. You've, you've increased your efficiency. So to me, I look at that and I kind of go, that's a horrible number. But then I realize there's a lot of potential in that number to actually make the changes that would be beneficial. But you, it's, a, it's almost a way of having your cake and eating it too. Because I really don't think that people voluntarily ratchet down unless that decision gets made for them and like a piece of the economy gets sliced out from underneath them. Yeah, I, I, um, I want to speak to Jesse's point about dignity and, and, um, and having a purposeful work. And of course, that's the focus of my whole climb system was to create like a workaround system where everybody had an opportunity to contribute something positive and had a positive social role. And that's exactly what, as we're talking about, it's been stripped away, right? Because you either have a job in a globally competitive industry, which of course is some tiny sliver of what used to exist, and it's like a monoculture and it's super dependent and fragile. So that's that's a obviously a system that's broken at multiple levels. Um, but I also want to talk to Mark's um, concept of, of uncertainty, you know, that, that you wrote about a, a couple of weeks ago. And it's like, well, if you're going to depend on this fragile global system, there's a huge amount of uncertainty. Whereas to follow Jesse's example, there's actually meat in your local community well, then there's a certain amount of uncertainty that goes away, right? I mean, you have a lot more confidence in your local economy because it's um, now there's multiple sources of food, there's multiple sources of employment uh, and, and all of that. So um, we, we get, I guess I'm trying to link up the idea of, of immense uncertainty is linked to extremely fragile global systems because that the, the dominoes are falling and we don't know where they're going to end up falling. That We know that they're going to hit us somehow. But if you have a local resilient uh, economy with hundreds of different producers and suppliers, well, then you don't have so much uncertainty. And so life is, is better on that level. And it's also like more opportunity to work. And, and I would say what we're looking forward to is, is people realizing that their that purposeful work may not be super lucrative but they won't it maybe it won't have to be super lucrative if the cost of living goes down you know um so so there's there's that plus and i want to speak lastly to jesse's comment about how the internet and and technology can be used um one of the linchpins of, of my thinking is what we've opened up with the internet is best practices can be shared right for, for basically free and so um, somebody in, in Tanzania might come up with some sort of water purification thing or some no-till farming thing that works on their soil. Well, it might work in Australia or, you know, Cambodia, who knows? <clears throat> and so we have this access to best practices in which we didn't have two generations ago. It was very hard to figure out, well, what's the best thing for me to do um, in terms of boosting my productivity or organizing something in my community. And now there's a bunch of of ideas out there that you can access and get the and and use the appropriate ones for your community. You know, it, it's funny you say that because I was thinking the inverse the other day. How <laughs> grateful I am that there are worst case scenarios available. I mean, one of my favorite subreddits is idiots in cars, and it's basically just all these different videos of really stupid drivers or really stupid traffic incidents. And I was thinking about it today while I was on this, what turned me a six hour road trip. And I was like, it really reinforces why road safety is essential. And even though I'm impatient and I want to speed to get home, I've been watching idiots in cars and it reminds me why speeding is stupid. And so <laughs> as a result, I'm going to be patient because I now know that worst case scenario. And similarly, Whenever I screw up, and this might be a screw up with like a mechanical uh, machine, this might be a screw up with something on my land, I can always go and Google that screw up, find someone else who had a similar screw up and learn from their mistake. So while I agree with you entirely that we can learn from people's games, I also think that learning from people's mistakes is the other kind of magic of the internet really uh, enables the kind of, of, of learning and responsiveness that we would associate with these types of resilient systems. Is that one of your cows mooing in the background? or? Sorry, that no, was that just some... me. 
<laughs> that was me. Unfortunately, the motorcycle went out. I mean, I'm on a busy street, oh, so no worries, you know, no worries. loud trucks. And stuff. Sorry about that. That's good. But I, Charles, I, I, I'm in a town. I'm in a town. So. <laughs> well, I'm sitting here in Toronto, man. But anyway, um, <laughs> you know, it's ironic what you say about certainty, or the irony around what you say about certainty, Charles, is that with this really tight, brittle, just-in-time supply chain that you talked about last week how the envelope is getting tighter and tighter and tighter with which you can operate in and you go outside that envelope and the plane crashes so to speak is we had this illusion of certainty the more frail the system became under the hood like you just thought oh you know this this, this world is great i can just press a button on my phone and some guy's going to walk through the door with my lunch as sure as the sun's going to rise tomorrow, you know, in 15 minutes of just boom, here's my sandwich. I don't, you know, and that seemed like a sure thing. That's a sure bet. And in the matter of like six weeks, all of that became, well, I don't know. I might press the button on my app and nobody's going to show up with my food. How am I going to eat? You know, where does the food come from without the guy from Grubhub bringing it to me? I don't know, you know, and, um, there was something else I was about to say as well, and my mind just went completely blank. But I think this notion of dignity and self-reliance and not just sort of knowing where your food comes from, but having the agency to do something about it, I think is a really defining characteristic of this era. Because I think those of us who are willing to do that, those of us who are intellectually curious, you know, the people who are doing the research to figure out, do I wear a mask or not? While we may be just as anxious as everyone else, I think that we are less anxious because we have a greater sense of what we desire and what we need. And I think to me, that is a, an encouraging aspect to this crisis, that there is a growing constituency of people who think for themselves, who are ready to act for themselves, and given the right opportunity, I think would, would, would really rise up. And that's where when we were talking earlier about regime change, you know, I, I no longer believe in ideology. Instead, I believe in pedagogy, right? I believe that the, the people who help us learn, the, the people who help us make sense of the world are the people that we can trust. That, you know, authoritarians will still use ideology, but in a democratic society, I kind of feel that we are entering a culture of learning, a, a culture of knowledge sharing that requires a new type of leader. And I've kind of joked in the past that these are YouTubers, that YouTubers are, are the kind of pedagogues and therefore leaders of the future. But I, I think that there is an opportunity for, you know, whether it's from the blockchain world, whether it's from the open source world, or whether it's from some of the political environments that exist online, I'm really interested to see this kind of leadership, to see this kind of vision emerge, because to me, that's necessary for us to get into this next stage uh, of truly building the kind of decentralized democratic society that we talk about. Yeah, I'd like to speak to that directly because we, we spoke about the savior state uh, <laughs> last last uh, salon. And what I think what Jesse's describing is absolutely correct, you know, that we need a new leadership, but we got to have the, the sort of Overton window or the space for them to be able to maneuver. And so that means local, local leadership, right? And so um, like we were talking about abattoirs and local meat sources. Well, in the, in the U.S. as a generality, the restrictions are so vast, no one can afford to, to do that because you have so much paperwork and the fines if you get you know, like, for instance, this this may sound ludicrous, but if a goat slips off the back of the truck while you're unloading the, the goats for slaughter, um, that's animal abuse. You get a ten thousand dollar fine. Now, OK, that's fine. We understand the disconnected bureaucratic mindset that led that. Right. Like, well, we have to punish people who abuse their animals. And so then you get these absurd over-regulatory things. And, and this is true in the EU too. I mean, I've, I've watched a lot of documentaries on EU agriculture because my brother lived in rural France for like almost 20 years. And, and the, the, the farmers are saying, you know, it's like, I can't afford to farm. I'm sitting here at a desk filling out EU paperwork most of the time. <laughs> and so 
we need to be able we need to look ahead and say okay if the local you know leadership has the rights if you will to to make adjustments then we can really move forward and and speaking to that like i'm in a you know a tourist dependent place and i think i'm seeing conversations come up around the world with the same kind of positive uh view that we're talking about which is how can we create a different kind of tourism that's actually sustainable and better for us and the visitors and so um i i saw a little link from uh, the city of amsterdam and and it was like the residents are cheering the death of tourism because they they they, they feel like they finally got their city back and and of course i've read this about barcelona rome yeah. paris yeah. on and on and on in hawaii too when i first came to hawaii as a teenager there was a million visitors total for the year and that was a, some big benchmark and everyone was thrilled well last year it was 10.4 million tenfold increase in visitors of course these islands are cannot support that you know and, and so everybody's miserable you know like the tra traffic is horrible and every the costs go up and only rich people can afford it and on and on and on well so let's redo it you know and and so now people are talking about well maybe hawaii should focus on on energy creation you know like green energy and agriculture and only have tourism one part of the whole mix and that of course is is brilliant i mean it's obvious <laughs> but nonetheless to have people talking about it does give me hope Mm -hmm. another world is possible yeah and with local leadership as you say if once and and i think there's a lot of people who are willing to step up if they have that if they have some flexibility where they can actually make a difference if if it's all top-down regulation and they're and they're trapped you know or coerced to use your word uh jesse then then, then we're not going to be able to move forward i don't you know, sorry go ahead best case example I think that that look could be compared to a rash that the the more local leaders who sort of step up and demonstrate what can be done on a local level the more that they'll inspire other local leaders and you'll start to see you know the types of people who recognize it doesn't take much it just takes that desire for change on a local level but i think all of that what what that is what predicates what that is predicated on, unfortunately, is that the situation has to get worse before that starts to happen, because people aren't going to step into the breach with an alternate system until they have no other practical alternative, because the leadership is not going to let go easily. They're not going to say, oh, okay, yeah, you guys have an alternative currency or something like that going, you guys can take it from here. It's going to keep tightening that grip, tightening that grip, and then, like Charles' article on the Dow's reversals, it's all going to backfire, and that backfire is going to be messy. And that's when, unfortunately, I see you nodding your head vigorously, but that is the, um, that's the fertile ground into which people say, well, this clearly isn't working, and it's actually uh, making things worse so we're just going to do this out of necessity and you know up comes a local exchange currency up comes an open source decentralized agora that sort of thing so i i i don't disagree with your general narrative arc but i think there's an important distinction between for example a federal government and a local government Right? True. The federal True government that. Yes. It is is very difficult to deal with, very difficult to change. Local government changes all the time. Yes. And I think local government is where you'll you might have people just going, forget about it, I'm out of here. And the opportunity for new blood is literally whoever shows it up. And and further, I also think that the crisis facing small business, the crisis facing medium sized businesses, will motivate them to seek alternatives for the primary reason of economic survival, right? And that's where I am a firm believer in entrepreneurial change and the correlation between entrepreneurialism and social change. But I do agree with you, Mark, that there would be a pushback. You know, as you know, one of my favorite beats is, is connectivity and broadband. And as, as municipalities started creating municipally owned internet services, the state started outlawing them. Right. They started pushing back because of lobbying from the telecom company. So I agree there will be that conflict. And that's when alternative currencies, 
that's when alternative forms of copyright or intellectual property start becoming viable. But I think to Charles's point, we're going to see that local leadership. We're going to see that local initiative before any crackdown, before any change at a federal level. And I think that's what we, as Access of Easy, should be amplifying and encouraging. And it's those types of grassroots initiatives that have a natural energy, but the key to their survival will be the network of networks and the extent to which these separate decentralized initiatives can be part of something larger and claim the, the moral and political power that comes with saying, you know, we are part of history, we're changing the world. And, and again, that's where I'm cautiously optimistic that, that that is possible, in spite of the authoritarianism that we are seeing start to emerge pretty much everywhere around the world. Yeah, I know we're, we're, we're pushing up against our time, but I wanted to, my last point would be to speak to Marx, um, the resistance that's going to be occurring, right? It's going to be in, in the leadership that doesn't want to give up control, but it's it's also going to be in the top 5% of the technocracy, which has been very well paid for doing very little, right? And, and I'm thinking of these regulatory structures or the huge administrations within universities, right? I mean, it's like I've you guys have seen the same stats, right? The number of, of tenured professors has barely moved in 20 years, but the number of administrators making hundreds of thousands of dollars has gone up by like 40%, right? And so, and the same is true of healthcare and, and you name it, right? So all of these um, levels of basically BS work, that's just created regulatory thickets to uh, benefit the, the top uh, corporations. They all have to go away. And then they're going to be fighting tooth and nail to keep everything that they've that they've got right Their their fat pensions, their benefits, their big paychecks. And it's all like, well, actually, we don't need you guys. All you you are the obstructive class. You're not the enablers that you tell yourself you're actually in the way. And so we don't need those three layers of administration in in, um, in all this stuff. And so I, I'll give you one last little quick example. You know, in the state of California, 40 million people and essentially a nation in it in itself, right, in terms of population, economy, and so on. Well, to Jesse's point, there was a movement where people were realizing, you know, we're killing really small businesses, right? So-called small businesses actually multi-million dollar operations. What about really small businesses like somebody working part time? Well, they, they actually roused themselves because of the <laughs> economic benefits and they enabled, they uh, made legal $25,000 a year businesses out of your home. And that was always illegal. You had to have a three thousand dollar a month storefront or you know cafe, and so now you could actually do stuff, make food at home, and make up to twenty five thousand dollars a year. Now that it wouldn't be much for them to boost that to fifty thousand, right? I mean, the, the thing's already in in place. But that's the kind of movement where uh, I, I am hopeful. But you're going to have to strip away huge amounts of bureaucracy, and um, and then then all the all the landlords who were demanding that, that tenants have to pay 3000 a month for this tiny little stall, they're going to be politically motivated to protect their turf, right, and, and try to push back. And so there will be battle royale politically. Mm -hmm. Any closing thoughts, Jesse? No, other than I think that they're, you know, we like to look that part of the purpose of access easy is to fill the void left by the corporate media or the lamestream media. And, and I think there's an opportunity there because I think part of neoliberalism's success was the mythology created by the corporate media, which was a primary beneficiary of the neoliberal economic order. And now we have this opportunity where on the one hand, there isn't really state-based media in any practical sense because that was the role that corporate media played. And corporate media is on the ropes. They're, you know, almost decimated when it comes to their big model and their ability. So what I've enjoyed about today's discussion is it kind of highlights a lot of what our editorial focus should be, which is highlighting these case examples, highlighting and championing the types of stories, the types of examples, the types of initiatives that facilitate this type of decentralized, locally governed political economic democracy. And, you know, I think that's what we all do individually. And I think what's interesting about this discussion is it brings it to the level, not just of theory, 
not just of policy, but of practice, of understanding how this all plays out. So I kind of want to propose, and I, I'm not saying we commit to this, because in the midst of this crisis, seven days is a long time, and we have no idea what's going to happen in the next seven days. So I don't think we should commit. But I, I found Charles's point about universities and the bloat from administrations being particularly relevant, because I think the educational sector is an area in which this crisis is going to bring a day of reckoning sooner, sooner rather than later. I think it's happening now as students and families decide whether or not they're going to go to school in the fall because they're being asked to pay the same prices and you know that they're going to get nowhere near the same level of quality of education. So I would be interested at some point, potentially next week, if not later, us talking about what the future of education means and what kind of educational system would fuel the type of decentralized democratic society that we're imagining. Because again, this is where I think there's an opportunity because I feel that post-secondary education as we know it is coming to a hard end. That doesn't mean they're not going to be in denial. That doesn't mean that these institutions don't have deep pockets to go on for a long time. But I think their legitimacy is starting to falter dramatically the way that the corporate media's legitimacy is also starting to falter. And I think that that could be fodder for a very interesting discussion. Good. And I'm just going to tack one thought onto to everything we've said today. And that is, I think Access of Easy can even go beyond talking about this and actually becoming active in, an, in this actual movement. I'm thinking right now, first hit, first thing that comes to mind is the micro ISPs. Jesse, you've been covering them in your Future Tools segment, and we've been sponsoring that segment. But I get the occasional email from customers who are saying, I want to start it, you know, I've been reading Jesse's Future Tools, I want to start a micro ISP over here, Who, do, you know, and we start putting them in touch, I put them in touch with you, we can start putting them in touch with each other, and we can actually start creating like an active clearinghouse, peer-to-peer -peer kind of exchange of ideas, resources, know-how, and really, you know, help pitch in and become almost a kind of catalyst or lubricant for this kind of a movement. I think that's a perfectly natural thing for us to do. It's a good thought to end on. Okay. All right, guys, as always, it's been very nice talking with you both we'll see you next week and we are going to do we are going to pray to the algos that we got all this on tape